Hello everyone, it is Friday, so that means it's time for another MTG Top 10. I'm Nita Hone, and this week we're looking at the Top 10 Legendary Artifacts in the History of Magic. Before we get started, I do want to remind you that you can find my content, along with a plethora of other Magic the Gathering articles, podcasts, and more at fivecolorcombo.com. In addition to that content, Five Color Combo is also building the first drafting, brewing, and playtesting app for web and mobile that work together seamlessly. If you want to support their project, check out their Kickstarter now, and details are in the description of this video. Anyway, while some of my lists are less than empirical, focusing on my opinion about cards and so forth, about half the time I do a list like this one that bases the positions in the top 10 on how many top 8s a particular card has appeared in at the Pro Tour and Grand Prix levels. In the past, I've just sort of based where I put these cards on the raw number of total top 8s. Starting with this list, I'm debuting a scoring system that I think does a better job of representing just how successful a particular card was. Basically, the scoring system seeks to reflect the fact that Pro Tour competition is generally much stiffer because they're not open tournaments, and top 8 a Pro Tour is considered to be a greater achievement because of it. So getting a top 8 at a Pro Tour is considerably more impressive than at a Grand Prix. As I've done in the past, with each card I discuss, I will include some relevant statistics about the card, and this will now be included as alongside uh, the other statistics as the card's score. I do have some reservations about this system going forward, especially now because all Pro Tours are only the standard format, but for now, I think this works. Now, let's discuss why I chose this oddly specific topic for this week's MTG Top 10. Kaladesh, which has just recently been released, features two legendary artifacts and both have generated a decent amount of buzz. People are trying to find a way to break Aetherworks Marvel, and Sky Sovereign Console Flagship seems like a likely candidate to be featured in several top eights in the new standard. It's a strong card that can avoid uh, sorcery speed removal and board sweepers, so I see it being pretty good. Seeing these two legendary artifacts uh, get a lot of attention, it made me wonder what the track record is for other legendary artifacts, and to be honest, it's pretty good. Of 42 legendary artifacts that have been printed before these two, 15 have at least one premier event top eight. That's a pretty good rate. Obviously, we're only looking at the top 10 of those, so let's go ahead and get started on our list. At number 10, we have Bosch Iron Golem. Bosch is a pretty sweet card for any deck that can cheat artifacts into play. He himself has a massive body with trample, and on top of that, he can start flinging huge artifacts at the opponent for massive amounts of damage. This works particularly well when you sacrifice an artifact with a high converted mana cost and somehow put it back into play to do it again. This was basically what people did with Bosch in the extended format between 2003 and 2005, where he made all of his appearances alongside cards like Goblin Welder and Tinker, who could cheat artifacts into play incredibly easily. Bosch hasn't seen any play since Extended ceased to exist as a format, and if Sky Sovereign manages to have really any success at all, it is likely that Bosch gets booted off the list, but he's a pretty fun commander and he's on the list for now. At number 9, I have Bow of Nylea, the first of the legendary enchantment artifacts from Theros on the list, but not the last. Bow of Nylea is pretty sweet. In addition to giving your creatures death touch when they attack, it is a bit of a Swiss army knife, giving you four different options when you pay one and a green. You can either make creatures bigger, deal damage to flying creatures, gain life, or put cards from your graveyard in the bottom of your library. The fact that it could do several different things made it a pretty common sideboard card when it was in standard. Life gain was good against aggressive decks, and many, format, many decks in the format ran flyers who could die to two damage. Bow of Nylea's utility is so good that in 2015 it even managed to show up in the sideboard of a modern elves deck. The fact that this card can do so many things means that we probably shouldn't completely discount this card going forward, and it could improve its resume in the future. At number 8, I have Hall of Triumph. Both it and Bow of Nylea have 7 points, but I gave Hall of Triumph the tiebreaker because it wasn't a sideboard card, and that is primarily where Bow of Nylea has seen play. Hall of Triumph is a pretty simple card. It gives an anthem effect to all creatures of a certain color. It loses some of its power by the fact that it is legendary, since stacking anthems can be pretty great, but still, lots of aggressive decks played the card in standard, namely Devotion to Blue decks, Red deck wins, Gruel deck wins, all decks featuring mostly creatures of one color, of course. It hasn't seen play since it rotated out of standard, and it probably won't, but it put up some good finishes while it could. At number 7, we have the second golem on our list, Karn Silver Golem. I have to admit, being able to include him on a list is sort of special for me, because he was actually the first rare I pulled in the very first magic pack I ever opened. I've had a soft spot for Karn ever since, at least as long as I'm not playing against a Tron player running his Planeswalker version, but anyway, yes, Karn Silver Golem put up some good numbers in his day, and that should come as no surprise as his effect is actually quite powerful. 
And not just in the obvious way of making artifacts into creatures, his ability could be used to nuke the Mirrodin block artifact lands for just a single colorless mana. While he saw a bit of play before the printing of artifact lands, showing up in an artifact-based deck during Urza's block constructed called Utility Belt, he also showed up in main boards and sideboards along the other golem on this list, Bosch, in Extended, where he was brought in to handle the troublesome artifact lands that Affinity decks tried to abuse. Karn has also been seeing some play in Magic's most powerful format, Vintage, where he can be used in a similar manner, blowing up Moxes and other zero-mana artifacts for only one mana. Unfortunately, Vintage doesn't have any Grand Prix or Pro Tours, because if it did, it is likely that Karn would make an appearance on some more top eights. At number six, we have another one of the Cycle of God's Weapons from Theros block, the Hammer of Perforos. While it doesn't quite have as much utility as the Bow of Nilea, Hammer of Perforos is pretty powerful. It gives haste to all of your creatures, that's a solid bonus, especially when the card can turn into a token engine. Once you have this in play, your opponent has to worry about the potential extra 6 damage that the golems could be doing by your next combat. The Hammer really only saw play in Standard, where it was a strong card in decks that focused on the Devotion mechanic, both Red and Boros, though it also made some appearances in decks without the mechanic, such as Naya Control, which could hang back and control the game until it could win the, win the game with the Hammer, and Red Deck wins, which used the card to make the deck even more aggressive, while also allowing for a pretty explosive late game. The Hammer has not seen play since it left Standard, and it seems unlikely to put up any more high finishes in other formats. So, from here on, there's a pretty big jump in the scores of the cards we're going to see. As you can see, the Hammer has a score of 10. All of the rest of the cards in this list finish with 24 or more. Now, let's take a look at number 5. At number 5, we have one of the cards that it feels the worst to play against in all of Magic's history, Mindslaver. Mindslaver is an interesting card, not just because it has a one-of-a-kind effect, but it is also one of very few rares in Mythics to have been legal and standard twice without ever being printed in a core set. It's a little fun fact. It was originally printed in Mirrodin and was reprinted in Scars of Mirrodin. Despite that, the first time it was legal and standard, it basically saw no play. Where it first made it big was in Extended, where it appeared in a number of different decks that tried to abuse the card. In fact, Mindslaver appeared in seven of the decks in the top eight of Grand Prix New Orleans in 2003, which was an Extended Pro Tour. One of these was a Tinker deck, which was sought, which sought to just loop Mindslaver over and over again, much the way Tron decks do today in Modern. It also appeared in the original Goblin Char Belcher deck, which appeared in Extended, which sought to use Mana Severance and Char Belcher to win the game, but the deck also ran a Mindslaver lock as a backup plan. And another deck was actually the same exact deck that ran Bosch Iron Golem and Karn Silver Golem, another deck that sought to reanimate artifacts over and over again, humorously called George W. Bosch. Eventually, people realized the thing was super good in a deck that could ramp quickly, too, so it appeared in a Mirrodin block deck that used Cloud Post to create a bunch of mana before it appeared in the deck that it's, is still its home today, Tron, first in its extended version and now in its modern version. Tron is still a deck to be reckoned with in modern, so it is pretty likely this legendary artifact continues to put up high finishes. Next up, we have yet another of the cycle of legendary artifacts from Theros block, but still not the last, Bident of Thassa. While Bow of Nilea is nice as a Swiss Army knife, and Hammer of Perforos was a nice card to have in red decks, Bident of Thassa blows them both out of the water. Drawing a card any time one of your creatures connects is ridiculous, and it is made even better by an effect that forces your opponent's creatures to attack. Bident of Thassa appeared in one of the strongest decks in Standard in 2013 and 2014, Mono Blue Devotion, and it was a key card in the deck, ensuring that you would never run out of gas. It never really made an appearance anywhere else, not even really in any other deck when it was in Standard, and it seems unlikely that it ever will, but man was it a nasty card when it was in Standard. Any sort of card that pays you off for playing a bunch of creatures and also draws you cards is kind of ridiculous because it just makes an aggro deck. One of the weaknesses of aggro decks is usually that they run out of gas, and Bite into Thassa just doesn't let that happen. At number three, we finally have the last card from the cycle of legendary enchantment artifacts from Theros that will be appearing on this list, Whip of Erebos. Spear of Heliod is the only one from the cycle not to make this list, but this is probably a reflection of the lack of a deck that really focused on devotion to white. Following a trend with this cycle, Whip of Erebos first made appearances in decks that focused on devotion, in this case to black, as well as in decks that focused on the constellation mechanic, which paid you off for playing enchantments. Unlike Biden of Thassa, which ceased to be relevant once Cons of Tarkir brought the world Siege Rhino, Whip of Erebos found a new home in a deck called Sidisi Whip, which sought to fill the graveyard with Sidisi and then reanimate creatures from it with the Whip. 
One of the more powerful things the deck could do was bring back Hornet Queen, who would hit the opponent in the air and gain you life, and leave behind a swarm of flying Hornet tokens who could do the same. The whip hasn't seen play since it left standard, and like most of the other cards from the cycle, it probably won't, but it definitely shined the brightest of the cycle when it was in standard. At number two, we have Mox Opal. This is a case where the card doesn't really seem to be legendary, but making it legendary was probably necessary to balance this thing because it's pretty nuts. Most cards with Mox in their name are really good, and the Opal is no exception, having put up impressive finishes in four different formats and never even going an entire calendar year since it was printed without showing up in at least one top eight. It made its first top eight appearance at Pro Tour Paris in 2011, where it was in an artifact-based control deck that sought to win with Tezzeret. It then showed up in the dominant deck of Scars of Mirrodin Block, Tempered Steel, an aggro deck featuring artifact creatures, which was so good that it also saw success in Standard, while also showing up occasionally in the equipment-based Pure Steel Paladin decks of the block. Then it moved to Modern, where it is a key card for Affinity decks that continue to flourish in the format today. Mox Opal isn't done yet, but I doubt it really has a shot to move up to number one on this list, which is... Umazawa's Jite. Wizards had a hard time designing equipment in its early days. They made Skull Clamp and Dark Steel, and it is one of the most busted cards of all time, and then two sets later, they printed Umazawa's Jite. This thing, this thing seems sort of innocuous. You might look at it and say, well, it doesn't do anything unless the creature can attack, so it can't be that good, right? Wrong. Umazawa's Jite got ridiculous even after doing combat damage once. One key thing about the card that made it so powerful is that the GT itself can use the life gain ability and the minus one, minus one ability. So you can send a useless creature into battle with only the intention of getting some charge counters that would give you a stupid amount of value later in the game, and you don't even have to equip the card again. It has those charge counters. What's even worse, though, is in the days when combat damage used the stack, it was possible to get the charge counters and use them during the exact same combat. Basically, GT showed up in every creature base deck in every format it could while it was legal, and in so doing, it put up the most impressive resume of any other card on this list, completely blowing Mox Opal out of the water with almost double the score. It shined in block, standard, and extended. When extended ceased to exist and the modern format was created, Umazawa's Jite was instantly banned, and you can see why. It still sees play today in a variety of legacy decks and continues to build up its resume while also being a staple in EDH. Well, that does it for this week's MTG Top 10. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to click the like button. If you have any comments about this list or suggestions for a future list, mention them in the comments below. And if you want to make sure you catch MTG Top 10 each and every week, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching.